a merit of pastor. Now, he was amazing. I mean, the most considerate and thoughtful and kind. Like, this was like a French charm, and I thought that surely this is my present from God for being so obedient when he told me to erase all those words and not do anything. And not even eight months after we were married, he just changed it. It was like, it was like this person that was just so in love and just couldn't get enough of being around me and was just so affectionate and just so gracious and so um, compassionate turned into the, like this cold and callous and absent person. And then like he really would just come around, but go come home when it's time to like get the sermon ready for the next day. And then we'll get the sermon ready for Sunday. And then the next day we show up at church, like everything is okay. And that just didn't sit well with me because I was like, you know what? I don't want to be a fraud for, for myself or for nobody else. So I, I cannot keep going through this process of, of pretending. And so I started fasting and I asked God, I said, okay, God, you saw where I was before. Now here I am again. How did I get here? And then how do I get out of it? Because at this point, he was just treating me so mean. I just, I, like, I just did not know where it came from and how did I deserve this. But now I'm asking God, please just show me how did I get here and how do I get out? And so as I'm fasting, I am now, because I'm, I'm living in another city, so I'm now looking for my way back to Atlanta, where I originally lived, with all of my contacts and my career, all of my independence was in Georgia. And so I am on his iPad and I'm looking at, um, you know, places in Georgia where we're going to move. And at this point, he had gone and left the house for at least a little bit over 24 hours. So I hadn't seen him, hadn't talked to him. And this, these kind of disappearances just started happening as he started being really mean and aloof and just distant. And as I'm looking, there's an email that came through on his iPad. And when I opened it up, it was, that was the most devastating thing I think I have ever seen in my life. It was an email that he had just sent himself. And it was an email of a naked man. <laughs> and I thought, like, wow. For a second, it was, I was a little relieved because my first husband left me for a woman. What's wrong with me? What does she have that I can't? It, it made me doubt everything about myself because I'm another woman and another woman can come and, you know, and take my husband's attention, attention away. Like, why am I not good enough? But to see that it was another man, as disgusting as I felt, there was a sense of relief like, well, dang, I can't get what another man did, you know, can. So it's, it's terrible, but at least for my ego, it's not that bad, you know? But I mean, I was, and I was devastated. I was just like, this, got, this has got to be like the worst because all I started thinking about was my health, about my children, about me living a lie, about me changing my whole life to join in this lie that I didn't know I was in. It was just like devastating. That's probably the best word that I could say. So I am looking at this picture. And, then I, and in my mind, I'm figuring, you know, if you just sent this email to him, what other things like this does he have in his files, in his, in his emails. So I started looking through the files and his emails and it was like Pandora's box. It was men and women. It was just whatever you can think of was in the box. And so I think initially I was just like, you know what? He is going to die today. <laughs> I am going to end his life today. And I mean, I went through this and thank God he didn't come right home. It was at least another 10 hours maybe before since I saw it and then he came home. And I went through a roller coaster of emotions. At first it was anger and I'm going to hurt him and how could he change and put, put my life in, in, in this in jeopardy like this and I have children and I'm a mother and da, 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 da. And then I went to fear like, oh my God, my life will be in jeopardy. Like, oh my goodness, I'm exposed to a whole other lifestyle that I had no idea about. This is why the statistics, the, the statistics for heterosexual women in AIDS is so high because we have men that are doing this and the women don't even know. So they're not participating in the lifestyle, but then they're still affected by it. So then it was, it was fear. So it was anger, then it was fear, and then 
like I think I just started to kind of like start praying and asking God, man, what am I supposed to do about this? I, like, okay, I asked you to show me, but like, what am I supposed to do? And I think once I got to that point, I think my mind started to sober with, okay, God, I asked you to show me, you did. So there's no way that you're going to show me something for me to create more chaos. So what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to handle this? Because you're not going to give me this for me to make it worse. And I think as I started pondering that thought, compassion started growing in my heart. Like, I literally started feeling like, man, that's got to be a lonely life. That's got to be a hard life. Like, how long have you been living this secret? Like, I know me, I'm like this upfront and in person and transparent, what you see is what you get kind of person. I couldn't imagine living a life that was covered with so much darkness. And especially when you, you have two worlds, when one, you know, one set of people know and love you as this awesome man of God and uh, da, 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 da. And then another set knows you for what it is that you're really doing. Like, how do you juggle those two lives and still have some type of sanity or integrity about yourself? So I think I started feeling more compassion. And then as I got into the compassion zone, I, then that's when I started thinking like, well, man, it's got to be tough to be in those two worlds. And here I sit in the middle of both of them. Like I know both sides. So who has ministered to him knowing both sides? Just think, just hours before, I'm finding out that my husband is a heterosexual male that is attracted to men. Because remember, he's not gay. That's what I learned later. So I finally got myself together, went into the room with him, and I told him I said here. And I was like, you know, I started fasting, asking God about our marriage and how did you know, how do we get here? I said, but God showed me something that I just did not expect. And I said, before I tell you what God showed me, I'm just going to tell you that God loves you. I said, he loves you and he wants you whole, he wants you healed, and he wants you delivered. So this is how I started off the conversation. So he's looking at me like, yeah, right. Well, so what is, you know, what do you want? You're getting on my nerves. <laughs> like, almost like, go away, cousin, you know? So I said, well, you know, this is what God showed me. And I just want you to know that, you know, homosexuality is a, is a sin, and it's an abomination. I said, God, and God will, he will heal you, he will hold you, he will do all the things that you want or, or looking for in your life, but you cannot do it under the mask that you have been operating in. And I pretty much told him what I saw, and he said, as a matter of fact, I am not gay. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Like, he denied it to the hill. And I said, you know, I am not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know. And for the life of me, at that moment, I could not believe that he would say that he wasn't gay because all of the things that I saw. But it wasn't until, because I'm finishing up my master's in marriage and family therapy. And one of the classes that we were taking was how to counsel people in those type of relationships. Like, so it, it, me as a counselor, how can I counsel somebody in those relationships and be biased with me being heterosexual? And that was one of the categories of men that are, in their mind, heterosexual, but just happen to be attracted to men. And I, after the conversation ended, it was like, I'm not gay. I don't know what you're talking about. And the conversation ended. He left and never came back. Like, literally, he packed up his thing and didn't come back, and I packed up my things and moved, and eventually we split, and I came back to Atlanta, but, and he made it to the pulpit and made the church think that there was something wrong with me. Please pray for the first lady, you know? I don't know what's wrong with her, but I want you guys to please pray for the first lady, as if it was me, you know, that had turned on him. Well, like, I don't know. It was just like making them doubt who I was, but he, he was in the pulpit the next day. You know what's so crazy? When I... Um, I made an appointment to go see a doctor that, like that. This was Saturday, Sunday. That Monday, I had already made me an appointment and was in with the doctor before the week was out. And I went inside of the doctor's office, and I'm just broken. I'm like, I'm asking her, can you please just give me a test for everything? <laughs> like, whatever you have to test me for, please test me for it. 
And this was my first time seeing her because I was, of course, new in, in this area. So this was me going to the doctor for the first time. So she didn't have any history of me and we don't have any like relationship for her to have, I guess, a good bedside manner. She said, I'm sorry, you know, I've been practicing for years now and you will be surprised the women that come into my office for these tests, but that are okay with that lifestyle. That blew my mind. Well, certainly, of course, I would say, do not stay in a relationship like that because it's dangerous for your health and it's dangerous for your, your mental state. Leave, love yourself enough to, to not stay. And I mean, at this point, you don't stay for the children. You don't stay for the finances. You have to love yourself above anything else because I could have easily played the role. I had an amazing lifestyle. I didn't want for anything. You know what, Hassan? I felt like, I think in that moment, and this is what, what will help uh, the women or even men that find themselves in a situation to be able to make a decision and, and act on it, I decided I'm not a victim. Because I could have sat in victim mode and still be sitting in it today. That day, I could have been sitting in a row with me. How could he do this to me? And oh my God, this happened to me again, and I'm hurt again. And this is what's wrong with me. The, the victim mode is what makes you sit and simmer and stay. Because I decided that I wasn't a victim and that this is a lesson that I'm going to learn from. This is something that God is like, number one, God showed me so many lessons in it. Number one, He showed me that I can ask Him a specific question and He's going to answer it. I asked him, how did I get here and how do I get out? He answered it, <laughs> you know? And then he showed me that love that he says that surpasses all understanding. Because I'm in the heart, in the heat of the moment, and I went from anger to fear to, wait, oh my God, how sad is that? Empathy was just like pouring out of me. His God's love was just pouring out of me. So he showed me how even in that, deciding that I'm not a victim, I can still stand in a love that was that that carried me through and that started to heal me even when I was still in it. Like, cause it's no way that I'm not gonna be healed if I'm looking at the the perpetrator like, oh man. Like I saw the humanness instead of because at first I saw a monster. Like you are disgusting. You would you would bring somebody into this lifestyle, but then I saw the human, like, whoa, how devastating is that? So if they decide, I am not a victim immediately, then they'll start making decisions from the perspective of power and strength and not of, you know, um, weakness and, and, and um, insecurity. Like, I'm not a victim. I am not a victim. I can, I can decide today what my choice is because nobody can choose for my life the way that I can choose for my life. So today, because I'm not a victim, I decide you go ahead, you have your life, I forgive you, and I'm gonna move on. Cause you can only do it through, do it through forgiving them. Crazy enough, I think the recovery started immediately because when I learned like the power of forgiveness, I told the very last day that I saw him, like after that face-to-face -face conversation, I said, I forgive you. Like I did not feel it in my heart yet, but I said it. I said, I forgive you. And every day from then, I would write in my journal, just pray to God and forgive him. I forgive him and I release him. I forgive him and I release him. And I kept doing it until I really meant it. Hmm. So forgiveness was the, the catalyst for me that took me out of what could have been a long, drawn out grieving process to like every day until I believe it, until I feel it, until I know it. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray for, you know, that God will show him mercy. I'm going to pray that God will give him a clear mind, give him a clear heart, give him restoration. It's hard to be a victim and it's hard to stay in grieving when you're praying for the very perpetrator that in your mind could have put you there. Wow. So I prayed every day until I felt it. 